Well, it's the season of Advent, and of course, Advent, you know from your bulletin, Adventus in Latin means arrival or coming. And throughout the history of the church, we've celebrated Advent because it celebrates Jesus' first coming and then his second coming and, and glory. We celebrate both. That's right. She's excited about it. That's right. I think she's excited about it. Well, we're going to celebrate both this morning, and that's what Advent's all about. And we're going to reflect this morning on what we see in a text in Isaiah. So I hope you have your Bible with you. Turn to Isaiah, please. Isaiah. And while you're looking at Isaiah chapter, we're actually going to start in 10. We're going to spend a lot of time in 11, but we're going to go to chapter 10. Everybody, every culture, everybody wants peace, man. Everybody does. Everybody dreams of a world where there's peace in it, perfect peace. I said in the bulletin about Syria, the last children's hospital was just bombed. I think last I, when I wrote that earlier this week, there was only one hospital left in all of Syria. I mean, there's chaos every wars all over the place, ISIS. I mean, we're just the bomb, the news, we're bombarded with it. It's all over the world. And every culture dreams, every society dreams of a time when that won't happen anymore. Not only wars where there's bombs and, and so forth, but then smaller battles in our homes. Ever want peace in your home, peace in relationships, peace in church, peace at work? We dream of a world where that won't happen anymore. There's no more battle, no more doggy dog world, no more bitter backstabbing, no more knives in the back, no more gossip, no more hateful anything, just peace. And see, different cultures have different ideas of how to get there. In America, we tend to think that the way to get great peace on the world is to do it the American way. It's the American dream. You've seen those T-shirts that says, I am the American dream. So if we elect the right official, every four years we have this, this rhetoric all over again, right? When you get the right person in office, then all my problems will be solved. That'll stop all the riots. Then we'll all be unified together. We'll have all the unity and peace we really need. That's the American way. If you are Muslim, the peace comes because all governments adopt Sharia law. And that's the way to really get peace in the world is have all the fighting stop is everyone's got to submit to Allah through his prophet Muhammad. Or maybe if you're a Nazi, the way to get perfect peace is to rid out all the weaker races and just have a blonde hair, blue eyed Aryan race, and they'll be reign supreme. That'll give the ultimate peace. Every culture has it. Everyone dreams of that. We also dream of applying, not of peace only, but of justice, where rulers aren't bribed, where they're not just for special interest or the rich people or those who have a big education or fancy clothes. Rulers who just judge because it's the right thing, they just do the right thing. There's no lobbyists getting their attention left and right. We dream for that. And ancient Jews did as well. And around 720 B.C., a long, long time ago, uh, well, before then, in fact, Israel was a united monarchy, one big, long kingdom. Now, Israel itself, the land is tiny, but to them it was very important. And for three kings only, they were united together. And then they split up. And the north was Israel, we call Israel, and the south was called Judah. And the Assyrians, way over in the Babylonian area, they rose to power, and they were very much unlike by everybody else besides Assyria because they were ruthless. They'd come to town, kill on us, everybody. If they didn't kill everybody, they would take the leftovers as slaves in exile. And that's what happened to Israel. Around 720 B.C., they came in and killed most of the strong men who could fight back and took a whole host of people back to Assyria in exile. The Bible describes that event by the prophets and other times, in particular the prophets. The prophet Isaiah speaks about this, and he speaks about how Assyria is used by God to punish the Jews. But he's saying, it's your fault. If you've been sinning so much, this wouldn't have happened. So I'm going to send Assyria to basically discipline you. I'm going to send the exile. When that happens, eventually, I'm going to destroy Assyria as well. Their time's going to come to an end, and some of you are going to come back home and there's going to be a different kingdom set up. And Isaiah, we're going to start actually in chapter 10, verse 20. There's a couple of verses I want to look at, chapter 10, verse 20. So if you, uh, on that day, verse 20, do you have us say amen? 10, 20, on that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on the one who struck them, that's Assyria, but will lean on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people Israel were like the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed 
and all the earth. He's given them a hope. You're going to be really, really, really disciplined, but a remnant's going to make it. Go just the same chapter, go down a few verses, down to verse 33. Listen to what God's going to do to Assyria. As a metaphor, he describes Assyria as a tree. Look, the sovereign, the Lord of hosts, will lop the boughs with terrifying power. The tallest trees will be cut down, and the lofty will be brought low. He will hack down the thickets of the forest with an axe, and Lebanon with its majestic, majestic trees will fall. And there he's saying, like a tree, Assyria will be cut down. After you've been disciplined, Assyria will be cut down. In fact, that's exactly what happens. Now, what Christians did for a long, long time is whenever Jesus came in the Christ event, they looked back on their Old Testament and said, now I read these texts brand new. And the next passage we're about to read has been very influential throughout the history of the church. And it's from Isaiah chapter 11. Now, let's look what happens in Isaiah chapter 11. He says this in verse 1, a shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. Now, that language of a shoot growing out of a stump is to demonstrate, again, again, stay with me here, is to demonstrate the remnant of Jews who are going to make it from that leftover. It's going to look dead. It'll look like God has wiped the Jews from the face of the earth, but he hasn't. It's going to look dead and dormant. Now, all through Palestine, there are trees that go dormant, that look completely dead, and then the season they come back. The place where I lived right before in Sugarland, Texas, I had this uh, rose bush. I think Satan possessed it. I'm not sure. I can't prove it. it well, what was it? It wasn't a rose bush. It made pretty flowers. But we came back. It had the thorns about eight inches long. You know, those massive thorns. And these branches about 30 feet long. And so when you cut them down, they hit the ground. Or if they died, they would drape over. Of course, the kids were playing in the backyard. I don't want to get cut up with these big old thorns that hurt. And more than one time, I cut myself on it. And so I cut it down. Cut down the next year, did it again. I thought, okay, this is enough. I'm going to chop this joke. I'm going to be the man. So I got an axe. I was quack, 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 quack. I was clopping it down. You should have seen it, William. I mean, I just manned up. I got that bush. It came all the way down, and I thought, I might as well dig it up. And there's, I don't know to dig it up. I'm just, it's just a stump. It's nothing. Until the spring came. One morning I woke up, and skadoosh, all these, these big fat limbs were long over the fence with flowers, all pretty with massive little thorns all over them again. Chopped it down again. Boom, I made it. I got it. Next year, guess what happened? Same thing, Sean. Bushes everywhere. I thought, what in the world is going on? It looked dead. I mean, if, if you had bet me money, I would have bet my paltry savings. There's no, I chopped this thing down. There's no way life could come out of what looked so dead. That's exactly what the Jews thought of their situation. Imagine for a second they beat down these doors. Most of the men in this room would have been killed. They take most women back as sex slaves to work in different places in a different country. Lawrence would be almost no more. And a prophet writes to you and says, yeah, it's because you sin, but if you hold on, you're going to be redeemed. There's going to be a small group that makes it back home. And from that little stump of nothing, I can bring new life. Not too long ago, not too long ago, back in the 60s, excavations that were Herod the Great's palace in Masada. You can go there today to Masada. They found this cache, different, different pots inside this little part of Herod's palace. They found different pots of different things. One thing they found was full of seeds. And the seeds they found, what is now extinct, a Judean, Judean date palm. It's called Tamad in Hebrew. Hence David's daughters, King David's Tamar. You've heard that language if you know the Bible. It's a beautiful flower. Well, that was a very, very well-known plant in the ancient world, but it went extinct about 1,800 years ago, around the year 200, it stopped, just stopped. Well, they found these date palm seeds, 1,800-year-old. No, 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 these were Masada, so this was a little bit old, almost 2,000-year-old seeds. They thought, let's see what happens if we plant them. And they did. And this is the plant, plant at Kibbutz Ketorah, which is down south Israel. It's nicknamed Methuselah, the oldest Bible character there is. These almost 2,000-year-old seeds, you can go there today and visit the plant that's now growing and bearing fruit, and bearing fruit, and that's the tree. Listen, sister and brother in Christ, you need to know the God we serve. No matter how dead it looks, no matter how, what dormant is in your life, God can make new things arise. 
See, evil wants to tell us when we go through a lot of hell on earth and we've been through horrible things in our past, we still make horrible choice and we're still stuck in sin or patterns, never mind he's going to give up. It looks too bleak. It's too dead. Evil says, that's right, I'd give up. I'd leave the faith. I mean, many people through the years have just left the faith because of that. I'm here to tell you that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible loves to take what looks completely destitute and make it new. We wake up one morning like I did in Sugarland and go, how in the world did branches eight feet long just grow up on that thing? I chopped it down. I did my best to kill it. And the plant said, I don't care what you try. It was in the plant to grow. If you're still alive, you've got growth left. I'm telling you, I don't care how old you are. I don't care how much you've been in retirement. I don't care if you've been divorced, if he walked out on you, she walked out on you. If you're poor, if you've got sin habits in your life, you still haven't gotten out yet. You're not good as you want to be. It doesn't matter. The God we serve takes dead, dormant things. We're convinced we should get rid of. And he says, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done. Amen? Do you understand? Does that sink in with you? That's the God we serve. That's not like humans. We like to give up on people pretty quickly. We throw things away. A pen doesn't work right away. We shake it, toss it. We don't get refill the ink unless you get a little fancy one. We throw it out. God doesn't throw it out. What has God placed in you? God in his great timing will and can and will bring new life. Keep going to say later on in the same chapter. And he tells the Israelites, I'm telling you, don't look at your surroundings. I know you're exiled. Do not let that dupe you. A remnant's going to make it, and out of that remnant, I'm going to raise up a king. A king. Now, you know something about Jesse. If you don't know much about your history, I'm Jesse, and that's okay. Jesse is in this family tree here. I'm going to quiz you at the end of the sermon, Chelsea, so make sure you pay real close attention right here. Now, look, the bottom line is Jesse was an old dude. He had a bunch of kids. One of those kids' name was David, it became the king. David had a whole bunch of kids. That's what kings did, they had a lot of babies, because they had a lot of women. And then great, 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 great kids later, they had Jesus. So Jesse was the, the father of David and goes forward. So in verse one, when it says a shoot will come out of Jesse, they mean a baby, a new person will grow up. But interesting, will come from Jesse means he's gonna be a David-like figure, a King David-like figure. And that's what he says in verse 2. Go to verse 2, because he describes what happens basically in verse 2 here of what was like having King David. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. That's exactly what happened to Jesus in the Gospels, by the way. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. There's a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And in that Greek translation of this same passage, there aren't six different spirits, if you count it, but seven, because it's whole and complete. And that's what Christians picked up later on in Christian artwork. Sometimes you'll see artwork with Jesus with seven doves above them. If you go to Revelation, it'll say the seven spirits over the churches. That's allusion probably back to this in Isaiah. So here we have this picture of an ideal king like David, who also had the spirit rest upon him. And of course, we know Christians, we'd say that's, that's Jesus. His delight would be in the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord means he obeys him. He has reverence for him. He does exactly what he says. Look in verse 3. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Let me pause there because he's saying it's not that he's, he's blind, but he's metaphorically blind. He can't be bought. Listen. We know that Jesus fulfills this. The one who really exists, Jesus, does not judge based on any kind of special occasion. Jesus maybe is happy for us that we decorate this nicely and all that, or we wear nice clothes, but that's not what he loves. He loves us, and he wants our hearts and minds. He doesn't want our fancy clothes, our education, our car and truck, or our status, or our retirement. He wants us. And he says, when it comes to judgment time, I won't look at all the stuff you've acquired you won't get to keep it when you die. But when you meet me, I will know exactly who you are face to face. And when I judge, Jesus will say the same thing. I will judge perfectly, not by outward appearances. See, the world tends to judge that way, right? Don't you judge people? You're going to judge people in this room. You look around, look how they're dressed. Oh, well, they must be this and that. Ever done that before? Raise your hand right now and stand up. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Good heavens. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you, Matthew. He's like, I did it. <laughs> Matthew said, I'm doing it right now. Look at you in the camera. That's right. 
Now, look, I'm teasing. We, we tend to do that as humans. Here Isaiah is saying the ideal king doesn't do that. He doesn't look at outward appearances. But he's not done there. Look what he says at the end of that verse. He shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth. That rod of his mouth, the picture that a big rod, a, a beating stick, comes out of his mouth. That's a funny image, but it's a metaphor for judgment. Over whom? The breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. That image is picked up by Jesus to Jesus in Revelation 1.16 and 2.16. It says, from the sword of his mouth he will judge the wicked of the nations. His spoken word judges. Verse 5, righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, faithfulness the belt around his loins. That's the same thing. Now, why, what's the metaphor for that? When you have these hour closing in the ancient world, most people wore one or two tunics on top. That was it. You might say kind of an underwear, undergarment, and a thing on top. If you wrapped it up, it would just a simple belt. Here it's the same kind of thing. It's right around him. The metaphor is it's who he is. It's close bound to him. It's in his character. It's who he is. That's who Jesus is. He's just that way. He's just that way. Just who he is. He can't not be faithful. He can't betray you or me. That's good news. That's good news. He can't betray you. He can't be disloyal. Think about that. Ever had someone betray you before? I've had many people betray me. He can't do that. That's not in his character. He won't do it. <laughs> That's good news. He goes on there and he says, paints the picture in verse 6 and following of what his justice looks like. It's so powerful it affects even the animal life. The wolf will live with the lamb, not the lion and the lamb. That's from the King James Version. It's really the wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. A little child, a little baby is going to lead them. A little baby. The cow and the bear shall gaze. Like, no, they will not. <laughs> Here they will. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, the aspis, the asp. It's a kind of cobra in the ancient world. It was a metaphor for royalty back then. The weaned child, that is just the, little, the tween, the little one, shall put his hand over the adder's den. The point is a play over dangerous snakes. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of what? The knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And on that day, verse 10, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. In the 19, 18, uh, 18, 20s, 30s, and 40s, Edward Hick drew over 100 paintings. And this you've probably seen a version of this, The Peaceable Kingdom. And he's trying to get at what I, we see in Isaiah 11. See, in ancient Israel, these animals were actual violent animals. We can picture that, right? You ever see that TV show, like unbelievable animal friendships, unlikely animal friendships? We play it sometimes. We see a, a deer and a dog playing together. The other day I saw a video of a polar bear. It comes up on this dog, Sherry. It was chained up. It was a like, snow dog way up in Alaska or something. And you thought, he's about to kill that. I mean, he's going to kill the dog. It's a big old polar bear. He's got to be 1,000 pounds. He walks up and starts petting the dog. Petting with his big fat paw. He goes, Rrr. the dog's like, what's up? Just sits there, pets the dog. I mean, so everything in you thinks you're about to be devoured. These are violent animals. And so what Isaiah has done here is picks every single violent animal he can find in Israel. And he says, when the king is enthroned, when the king really rules, justice and righteousness and faithfulness will fail so much that the entire animal kingdom you hear that metaphor? Everything will come under the knowledge of the Lord and submit to him. Because when you're submitting to the king, you're at peace. In our culture, that's not, American culture tells us if you want to be at peace, if you want to try to get at this right here, you've got to discover who you really are and come at peace with who you really are, particularly in American culture when it comes to sexuality, but all kinds of things, whether it be clubbing, drinks, drug, whatever it is. The issue is you've got to come with peace to who you are. Then you really find peace. I've met many people through life who've said that. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says inside of you, when you have your kingdom, you're not all good. You can come with peace all you want with yourself, but you're not good. That's the biblical picture of humanity. On our own, we're evil. That's what the book of James says. On our own, you ask for things you don't get, you have wars because you lust after things your, your flesh wants. On our own, that's who we are. That's the biblical picture. 
You and I have got to make up our mind who we're listening to. If we're listening to what American culture tells us, which is false, or listen to what Scripture tells us, which is true. The only conceivable way to find real peace in this life, as Isaiah is giving us a quick vision of this, is if we accept the peace of the king that comes in our hearts first. But we don't all want that. We don't all want to be peacemakers like Jesus says in Matthew 5. Because don't we oftentimes want the king to come and beat up the bad guys right now? I do sometimes. I want to come and stop the rockets right now. Stop the bombing right now. Right now immediately. And because of that, we get mad that we don't all, he doesn't force submission right now. Everyone should bend their knee right now. That's not the way Christians, we know in the Christian world, that's not how it works. God never forces submission like that in this world. So here's the real question I'm asking you now. We're moving on. I think Isaiah is still asking the question to a degree. Do I really believe that Jesus is the king worth waiting for? And please hear me, friend. I mean, really, really deep down, do you, really do you? Are you still a little bit trying to establish your own kingdom, do it your own way, try to get away with? Was it really that bad? Is it really? Come on, I mean, come on, David. Come on, Isaiah. Come on, Jesus. I don't want to wait on him. He takes too long. When we've got quick cooking rice, quick, quick cooking grits and oatmeal, we've got Burger King tells us have it your way. I mean, you know, everything around me tells me have it quick and easy and fast. And then Isaiah paints a picture of a king who's going to come. And when you do it his way, with the knowledge of the Lord fills it up, there's peace. But it's going to take time. We learn from Jesus that peace comes, and it comes within our hearts. This last thing, and I'm done. In the Christmas season, I'm encouraged, well, this Advent season we're starting, I'm encouraging, when you hear bells ring, you ever go on the side of the street and they're collecting, collecting money, right? Salvation Army. We hear bells all the time in music and so forth. I'm encouraging when we hear these bells and we think about the, the peace that's offered. You know the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day? They're all familiar. We live in cognitive dissonance sometimes. We see the chaos in our home. We see the chaos in our marriage or our kids, our family, our friends, and around the world. Sometimes as we're in disbelief. And I'm encouraging you now. Is he a king worth waiting for? If he is, when you hear those bells, you're going to think carefully and think, maybe in the midst of this chaos... I can wait for the king. And maybe in the midst of this chaos, I'll let his peace fill my heart and mind now that I might be a peacemaker, that I will act right now as if that kingdom of animals all together in peace has already begun. And it's going to begin in me. It's going to be in my home. I heard the bells on Christmas morning. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing singing on its way The world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black, accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. Amen. When it looks dormant and dead, he's not dead and he's not asleep. When all the buildings fall and all the war keeps going on, I'm telling you, there's still peace to be had on earth.